Kwe Kwe, Makwe Wabsha Kwe Indijnikas, Makwa Dodem, Shabbat Bajwa no Niki Onakona Don Jaba, Tichburn on Dayam, and Noki Jabawin. What I said in Algonquin, Amamuin, was hello, Kwe Kwe. Uh, I am called White Bear Woman, Makwa Wabsha Kwe Indijnikas. I belong to the Bear Clan, Makwa no Dodem. Uh, I reside in the traditional ancestral unceded lands of the Shabbat Abajwan First Nation, uh, Shabbat Abajwan Oniki Nokona Donjaba. I live in Tichburn, Tichburn on Dayan, and good morning or good day. Um, I've been asked to come to talk about the language and um, connection to the land and why it's important to me to do what I do. I teach Omamiwin which is uh, Algonquin language. And uh, it's important to me for language revitalization because, um, because of colonization, residential schooling, the 60 scoop, the millennium scoop, and uh, stuff that's going on, uh, a lot of First Nation people lost their connection to the land, they lost their language. Um, our culture and traditions and self-governance was outlawed and made illegal and um, we're currently in the middle of a revitalization and uh, reclaiming of our inherent rights and practices and traditions and that is all embedded in our language. So I'd like to read to you uh, from a quote that I was given a long time ago and I've actually laminated it so that uh, I have it hanging at home um, in my wall in my office. And I think it's a really important uh, information to have because currently right now uh, there's a lot of grumbling going on about how the youth of today are not respectful, they um, need to be told to respect their elders, to, be, to respect one another, to be courteous and show um, normal civilities to each other. Um, as speakers in the language, we never had to be told that. So that's what this speaks to. It says, um, speakers of Anishinaabe Moan never had to be told, respect women, respect re uh, elders, or respect children, because it was fundamental and it was built into the language itself. Ikwe, or the wood for woman, is connected to a key, which is earth. Both are life givers. The word for old woman, Mendimo Weya, actually breaks down to one that holds it all together, the foundation of the family. Old man, Aki Winsi, literally means earth caretaker. The word for elder, Kichi Eyeya, means great being. Our word for child, Abenonji, describes the spirit that is specifically placed here the values that are built into the language, and it is beautiful. And when we speak our language, um, it's important to understand that First Nation language is not structured the same as English because First Nation language is a descriptive language. So if I use our word for bear, which is makwa, it doesn't literally mean bear. It actually describes something that the bear has been observed doing. In our language, um, makwa, it, the base root for makwa is makak, which is our word for box. And the name makwa actually means literally the one who boxes himself in. And so when the name was given to the bear, it was because it was being observed making a den and closing itself in the in the den within the earth to hibernate for the winter. So our language is a descriptive language. Our name for places are descriptive as well. And so uh, Shabbat Abajwan, the community that I come from, Shabbat is the family's uh, last name. And Abajwan means where the water flows through the rapids. So if I go to Quebec or if I go to New Brunswick and I'm talking about where I come from, elders that speak the language understand and know where to find us because we live where the family Shabbat lived at the rabbit, 
rapids in Sherbert Lake. Um, and there are people from different native communities that don't know where Sherbert Lake is, but if you say Shabbat Abajwan, they know where that is because it describes the place literally. It's the same as the uh, reserve in Ontario for Algonquins. It's called Pequaknagon. And Pequaknagon means the lumpy or hilly place. Pequaknagon is actually a reserve that is in the Canadian Shield. So there's a lot of depressions and um, smaller lakes around. But when you're traveling, you're constantly going up and down because that's the way the land is formed. And so... Um, our language describes either what something looks like, a skill or an attribute that um, is associated with that animal or being, or it's a descriptive of um, something that that thing or that person or, or animal is seen doing. And so when we're talking about our language, um, it has a lot of cultural content in it. So even in our calendar, this is a Anishinaabe calendar. We use the turtle shell as our calendar because our calendar is made from um, our lunar cycle. So uh, if you look at the turtle shell, the outer scutes on the, the turtle shell, they actually have 28 scutes that go all the way around. Each scoot represents one day in a lunar calendar. So there's a definite number of days in our calendar, all our months have 28 days in them. So the names for our months are given because it's based on a phenological calendar. So unlike the Gregorian calendar, which is based on the number of hours of daylight during the day that you have, and the names come from uh, Greek or Roman or different um, history like that, this is based on things that happen in nature. So. If I'm looking at the name for January, it's Kudnozid uh, Gizis, which means the long moon month. January has the shortest number of daylight hours in it. And so it means that the nights actually seem to be the longest. And so that's why it's called the long moon month. Akodad, um, sorry, Akakodish Gizis means groundhog moon. And that is, has been adopted from the English from Groundhog Day. But in traditional calendar for my community where I'm from and my dad used to use, we would call it Makwagizis. And that's because in February, um, if the weather is warming up, so the seasons are getting ready to change and spring is on its way in, if it's warm enough, the mother cub will let their yearling cub out and you will actually see bear tracks in the snow to tell you that spring is on its way, so it's going to be a shorter winter time. But it's also because if they have been mated, the females will actually give birth to the bears, their cubs, in the den, and they will nurse them in the den from February until April or May before they allow them to come out. And that way, the cubs have a, a higher su survival rate because they're able to run away from predation and to escape danger by climbing trees. And they're able to follow after the mom. Zizibakwa um, Gizis, that is the month that we're in now, March. Zizibakwa means something sweet. And so it is actually named after um, the sap running up the trees in um, the spring. And we would go and tap the, the maple trees and get the sweet water from the maple trees boil it down and make it into maple sugar. Maple sugar was one of the first trade commodities that we sent to Europe um, as commerce to um, bring back. And only nobility could have maple syrup uh, at that time. And the reason, it, or maple sugar, and not that time. And the reason it was made into sugar and not syrup was because back then we didn't have containers that were water tight that you could carry liquids around the way we do now with pop bottles and that. And uh, if you wanted to sweeten something, like if you wanted to sweeten your tea that you made or you wanted to sweeten something that you were cooking, you would scrape some of the maple sugar off, put it in there. Um, and the way they stored it, would they would make uh, uh, wigwam macaque or birch bark boxes 
And as it was crystallizing and, and cooling down, they would pack it into the boxes, and then that would be used to carry around. So um, after March, we have Nimebin Gizes and that sucker moon. And so um, in my community, we call it Oga Gizes, which is pickle moon. So that tells us that at that time of year, the ice flow would break up, the pickle would start coming upstream, and we would go in spear pickerel to break our fast from the wintertime. Because in the wintertime, we eat a lot of preservatives and that. And by eating the fish, harvesting the fish and eating the fish to break that winter food cycle, the omega-3 fatty acids and that would help flush the toxins out of our system and um, help clean our system up so that we would be prepared uh, to uh, endure and do the things that we need to do in the summer. And so as you can tell by the calendar, each moon is named after something that is happening in nature naturally at that time period. So even though uh, this is a calendar we're using right now, this is to the area here. Each nation, and depending on what their geographical location was, would have their own calendar. So not every February would be um, Groundhog Moon or Bear Moon. Some actually call it Geese Moon because that's when the Canada geese start flying in. That's telling them that um, other things in, in nature are going to start happening and you can start harvesting uh, certain things that way. Um, if you look at the calendar, though, you'll notice that there's different colors on it. So we actually have four seasons, the same as everybody else, but we call them in a little different. So this is the growing moons, and it's colored green because it represents a spring. And so our new year isn't up here in January. Our new year actually starts here on the first day of spring in March. And uh, we have, um, we have uh, celebrations and we have ceremonies that we do to honor that. So then our summer we call the berry moons and that's because um, the first day of summer onward, we're able to harvest the berries from the plants that grew in the springtime. Um, and then the orange or the fall, we call those the harvesting moons. That's when if we're agriculturally based, we would harvest things out of our gardens or things that we grew. And if we're hunting, we would go out and hunt the big game in order to be able to have food stores for the winter. And then um, our winter moons um, are white and uh, from the first day of winter, which is the 21st of December, through until the 21st of March is our winter moons. And those were also called the lean moons because there's not a lot of game in that that you would harvest at that time uh, normally. So you would have the spring, the summer, and the fall in order to get everything that you needed. In the winter time, unless you were running trap lines, you would stay home and that was the time for you to spend time with your family, time to make your clothing, mend anything that had been broken or replace things that had been broken the year before. And you notice down here that we have a purple box, and this is called the spirit moon. And that is because currently we, we all live based on the Gregorian calendar. So the spirit moon is actually the second full moon cycle within a month. And so when we have a spirit moon, that tells us at that time that we do um, our prayers or we do our ceremonies to look after um, that season that, that that moon falls within. And the reason that that happens at different times of the year is because with the Gregorian calendar, the months have 28, 29, 30, or 31 days, unlike our 28-day cycle. And so our months are move according to the full moon cycle. And so sometimes on the Gregorian calendar, you can have a full moon at the beginning of the month and towards the end of the month. And so that's how come you have those two moons in the one month. Um, when we're talking about the language, we have teachings, and I'm not going to hold them all up, but we have teachings here, and I have them on the table, about um, the seven grandfathers. And in our seven grandfathers, they are our um, code of behavior that we try to follow. And so uh, we have what's called respect, 
love, truth, bravery, courage, wisdom, honesty, and humility. And I love teaching these to the children in the school and to people in my language class because when you say it in the language, the meaning is in the words. So if we lift this one up here, um, it's zong igidi iwin. Ide is heart. Zong means strong, so you need to have a strong heart to be strong or brave in your heart. And it actually goes with the teaching for courage. And um, the teaching for courage that we, we know of is to um, do what is right, even if you don't know what the outcome is, and, or you know that um, it, if you're doing what's right, it may have a negative effect or it may not be pleasant, but you still do what's right anyway because that's the correct way to, of being. And so, um, Niwaka Win is uh, wisdom, and that is being wise or intelligent, and it, it also encourages the, the use of knowledge. So having a lot of knowledge doesn't mean that you're wise. It's when you're able to apply that knowledge in a way where it's beneficial to you or others, then you can share that experience with others, and that becomes wisdom. Um, Humility in the language is daba din is a win, and that means to check yourself or check up on yourself. Make sure that uh, you're not behaving in a fashion towards others that you wouldn't want them to act towards you. Um, it's about not being boastful, and it's about um, whatever special gift that you carry that you excel at, that you use it in a way that it's beneficial for, for others and not just for yourself. And we have um, which means to act uh, appropriately or um, to follow through with adequate actions. And that is being truthful. And we always talk about uh, making sure that we're being um, honest in our actions, our words, and our deeds because our, our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions. And so we need to be thinking in a good way in order for those things to carry forward and be positive. Um, when we're talking about um, honesty and being honest as well, Gawayak Awad is a win means to go straight or follow the good way of life. And um, it's about those actions, words, and deeds. When we're talking about respect, it's minwa de da mawin. It's about speaking in a good way, not only about yourself, but about others. In our culture, um, we're taught that uh, if you don't have something nice to say, you shouldn't say it. Because if you're putting negative information out there, the negative information is going to come back to you. It's sort of like pointing a finger. If you point your finger at somebody, you have to be aware that you may have one po finger pointed at them, but you have three pointing back at you. So you have to be careful with what you're doing. Um, and Zagadawin is about love. And it's about um, being respectful in all things that you're doing. When you love somebody, you love them unconditionally. If love comes with a condition, with conditions attached to it, then it isn't love. It's manipulation. And so um, in the language, if you know the language and you understand it, when we're saying the words, the meanings are right there in the words. It's embedded in it. And um, when we talk about language and language revitalization, culture is embedded in the language just like I went through the seven grandfather teachings when you're learning the language, you're learning the meanings of the words and how it connects and how it connects not only to you and what you're doing, but it also connects to um, nature around you and how you affect others. And what I like about the culture is, and the language is that um, we don't live for ourselves. 
We live for others. We live to serve others or to benefit others. Just like the sun doesn't shine for itself to shine, the sun shines so that the plants can grow, so that we can have warmth. It provides a cycle of life for things. Um, berries don't grow just to benefit themselves. It, yes, there is a reproductive cycle, but in order to reproduce, it provides food for somebody else or for something else. And then by providing that food source for them, it gets replanted and it has that opportunity to, to go again. Fish clean um, water. Clean water ha helps the fish with oxygen levels in that, but the fish clean the water for us so that we have clean drinking water and it's not full of contaminants. Trees provide shelter and food and oxygen for us. They don't benefit from that other than by doing that, they have a chance to reproduce and be there again for the next cycle. So when we're, when we're talking about the language and revitalization of the language and the culture, what I like about it is that it's a circle. When you give, you get. And when you learn it and you're able to express it and share it, it comes back again and again. And it's beneficial that way. What I, what I would like to share um, right now is um, an email that I received from a student that's going to Trent University. And um, what he sent me, I'll read you the email. He says, hello, my name is Logan Cloyne. And I am writing a paper on indigenous groups and organizations within my area. And I was wondering if, you could, if I could ask you a couple of questions regarding your course and its purpose. Um, I'm handing this paper in for Trent INDG 1001 class. Um, I know you're probably quite busy, so I'll only trouble you for a few questions regarding your course, if that's okay. So the course he's talking about is my Omamuan language course that I teach. It says, uh, so question number one was, uh, do you only teach one Algonquin language or you teach other Algonquin languages like Cree and Blackfoot? So the Algonquin language, uh, Proto-Algonquin, actually covers about 150 different First Nations. And uh, the reason it covers the, the 150 different First Nation languages is because Proto-Algonquin was the language that we spoke when we were at the Big Salt, which was the shores of North America, when the glaciers had come down into North America. As the glaciers receded and we followed um, the prophecy of migrating inland, um, as groups moved from the, the coastline inland, it didn't happen overnight. It actually took close to 500 years or so. But as they moved inland, they came across different terrain, different plants, different animals, and they had to have a way to identify them, so they gave them names in our language, which is a descriptive. And so as they moved further and more, further away from the coastline, there were um, more animals, um, situations, and scenes that they had come across that um, they had to find language for. And as they moved, some people would stay where they were, and then other ones will migrate further in. And so as this migration happened, the language evolved because there was more content in the language. And so um, although we all might have started off speaking Maliset, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, um, as they moved inland, the language changed according to the acquisition of the descriptives of land masses, waterways, animals, plants, and experiences that they had. And so as they moved, the language evolved and they also broke into different dialects. And so that's why if you can speak um, Algonquin, you can basically understand any other Anishinaabe Moan language um, because it is part of the Proto-Algonquin dialect. So as someone who speaks Algonquin, when I go visit my friends who speak um, Ojibwe or Cree, um, they can speak in their language and I can speak in mine and we can actually have a meaningful conversation with each other 
even though we're speaking our own languages, because we can understand um, the meaning behind our conversations. And so um, to answer his question, I said that I only teach Omamuin. I don't teach Algonquin, or I teach Algonquin. I don't teach Ojibwe, Cree, or Blackfoot, as these are sub-dialects of Proto-Algonquin, and they're different languages um, that happened during our migration across Turtle Island. These other languages are more easily accessible for students that are interested than Algonquin, and that's why I provide the Algonquin. Um, what desired changes do you want to see in your community by teaching your classes, or do you just purely enjoy teaching each other or others the language? So my answer to him was, my desired change that I would like to see in our community by teaching my language is language and cultural revitalization. Helping my community renew its connection between the language and the land that we come from is really important. And um, it's important to bring back the traditional ways of being and knowledge about the traditional land, but also ways of knowing, doing, and being. Building bridges of understanding between native and non-native community members so that friends of community members can understand our cultural practices and language are really important. Um, I also love uh, teaching the language to others just because it took me a while to acquire my language and from doing that I like to share that with others and what I love is to experience or see hearing um, the aha moments where the knowledge of the language allows comprehension of the meanings of the words to a song or the meanings behind the name of something when you get the knowledge that goes with it and then you go oh yeah that's why this is that's what that means this is why that's important um, and it helps bring clarity for meaning that was missing before are there any issues that you believe are important that should be made aware of to the general public? Um, I put a great big yes with an exclamation point, and I'll tell you why. Not all, language, not all Indigenous languages are accredited on the accreditation list for language instruction in the Ministry of Education. Currently, Ojibwe, Mohawk, Creek, Delaware, and Oji Cree, and Oneida and Inuktitut are the only accredited Indigenous languages in Ontario. When I talked to the Minister of Education, I was informed that in order to have in another Indigenous language, let's say Algonquin or Michif, added to the list, the school boards would have to show the Ministry a demand for language classes in that particular language. The more requests received for it, the greater the chance for the language to be added to the list to be able to supply instruction for the language that is in demand. A minimum of 12 students is required to attend. You would also need to have an Ontario certified teacher to sign off on assessments and language curriculum instruction. So although I teach Algonquin to all the elementary students in uh, Granite Ridge Education Center, uh, JK to grade eight um, at Sherbert Lake, once a week in cooperation with the French language, um, none of my students will receive an accreditation in a mommy win on their OSR. And the reason for that is, is that it's not an accredited language. So, um, I would be required to attend a course to be a teacher of Indigenous languages as a second language, which is a two-year course to complete before I could hope to be able to give them accreditation in a mommy win which my students want to be able to do. So I have Algonquin students that don't want to take French. They want to, instead of having, they know that there is a second language requirement, they don't want to take the French to meet that requirement. They want to be able to learn their own language and be able to speak their own language. And that is um, a difficulty for them because they can't do it through the ministry right now. Um, I have students that want the Algonquin language credit instead of French, Mohawk, or Cree in their traditional Algonquin territory. This course is currently only offered for the teacher of a second language course in Lakehead University, which is in Thunder Bay, or in Nipissing University, which is in North Bay. And so that would mean I would have to travel and stay up north in northern Ontario um, to take the training in that 
in order to return home to bring the, that back to my community. Question number four was, do you enjoy your work? And if so, what do you enjoy about it? Um, I enjoy it very much. I enjoy the interaction with my students. I enjoy increasing my own knowledge of Omami Win, and I increase it every time I teach it to others. I still have aha moments. And um, I enjoy teaching the language and sharing the language with them. And when we're able to do it outside and in nature, it has more meaning for me because then they get the relevance between the words, the language, and the connection to the land. Um, the connection I feel to the land and the culture from helping others recover our language is, that is close to being lost is because our language is on the endangered list as our elders and speakers of the language are aging out and they're starting their star journey. So the understanding of the names that were given to the places where my ancestors lived and where I currently live now um, are important. Hearing my own grandchildren starting to use the language in my house and um, to hear my community be able to use it out in the community and to be greeted by students in the school in my language um, is really important be to me because it wasn't there when I was growing up. It wasn't an option for me. And so um, I, it's hard to put into words how I feel about saving my nation's language because alongside of learning the language and the meaning of the words, it also bears cultural knowledge and teachings of the lands that I walk in my ancestors' moccasin tracks. Um, and I offered to let him contact me if he needed any further information. Um, part of the revitalization that I think is important in the connection to the land is that um, our language was outlawed. It was made illegal. It was taken away from us. Our names were taken away from us. Our culture and tradition and our, and our practices were taken away. And so um, within the last year, the government of Canada has said it's okay to use our own traditional names as our names now so that we can legally identify ourselves in our language, in our name. And our names are important. Some cultures uh, and traditions provide that children receive hereditary names. So the name of a grandfather or a great-grandfather from a bloodline that name gets passed on. And so some of those children don't receive that name until after they've survived their first winter. So winter is uh, when we had our highest mortality rate. So our age didn't count from the time you were born. You started counting how, how old you were by how many winters you survived. So even to this day, when I ask somebody, um, uh, how old are they? Anin, uh, Das Baboon, how many winters are you? I'm asking how many winters have you survived instead of asking how many years have, has it been since you were born. Um, the connection to the, to the language is important too because in uh, our culture, our elders were the ones there to greet the babies when they were born and the elders would be gifted the name to provide to that child. Some names, like I talked about a minute ago, are ones that are handed down generation after generation. Um, some names are given um, by the spirit because that describes the personality of that spirit that's being placed here, the child that is being born. And some names you're given and you have to grow into. Some names you're given because of accomplishments that you've made through your life journey and your path. And so understanding what the language is behind the name gives you your place in creation. And it allows the spirits to recognize you and to recognize the works that you're doing while you're doing your earth walk. And um, so along with the, the language that I speak uh, in Omami, when I also learned Algonquin, I've learned a little bit of Cree, um, I know a little French, and I know a little bit of Russian, and I jokingly say to some people, and seriously I am sometimes about it, is that I know enough of some of the languages to get into trouble. I don't know enough to get out. <laughs> but um, I always enjoy learning the language because it gives me an insight 
to the culture and traditions of other languages. And so um, I was gifted this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not, but um, I was gifted this, and it is um, a syllabic for Cree. And so with the syllabic for Cree, they use shapes instead of letters for um, sounds. And so if I were to try to make my name, if I'm looking at Danka, I wouldn't put D-A-N-K-A. -A, I would actually use the symbols off here. So uh, these are all the vowels across the top. And if it's a short vowel sound, it is just the shape, depending on what angle the triangle or the shape is. If it's a long vowel sound, there is a dot above it that tells you it's a long vowel sound. And if it's a consonant, depending on um, the shape of the consonant, you would change the angle of the shape to match the vowel that goes with it. So my name, Danka, the first part of it is Da. And so D and T sound similar. So my the way I would start it, if I was to do it in syllabic, I would use the back or the C shape which is ta, and then to fill it in, I would put a small n, because n is in between two consonants, or at the end of a vowel, and beside a consonant, so I put in a small n, and then ka, I would look down the syllabic to where the k is, and then I would find ka, I'm gonna find it here, there we go, ka would be the b shape, so it would be c, with a small end above it, and then a B shape, and that would be Danka in the syllabics. And so, so that those shapes tell you how to pronounce those sounds. And so um, the Cree have syllabics. I also know the Inuit have syllabics, and there are some other languages that use a combination of um, consonants and vowels or syllabics when they're doing the language. and um, that was how we connected or commented on um, each other to learn the language. We also learned our language through music. So I have a song that I'm going to sing for you, and then I'll translate it for you. Um, it's actually a frog song. My friend Shar wrote this song, and she's from Mattawa. She also, she's also Algonquin. And the song goes, He wabi o magaki ni gamu. 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 And so the the lines we would sing four times. That would make one round. Um, and when I do this with the kids at school. The chorus in between is I get them to make frog sounds, and then we sing the song again. So, hey, wabi in our language means hey, I see. Omagaki is our word for frog, so our little description is the one who sits on the water. And then nigamo is I hear them singing. So when we say it literally, it's hey, I see the one who sits in the water, and I hear them singing. And so that is um, our frog song. And normally at the end, when we do our last round of it, I get the kids to sing it really softly and get to make really soft frog sounds. And then just about when they're finished, I do a loud beat on my drum and scare them all. And then I tell them I scared the frogs. And they, we get a chuckle out of it. But it's nice that they're able to learn the language and acquire it. And I can go into schools now and hear the kids singing that as they're going between classes and that. So um, language is important. I hope that you're able to connect and make a connection with your language um, to get the cultural teachings, to get where your place is on the land and in creation, and that um, you look for the, more of the meaning behind the words and in the words, and uh, that you're able to acquire your language and know who you are and where you are and what your place is in creation. Miigwech. Is well, that? Well, oh, okay. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, okay, ready. So when we're talking about language and we're talking about um, our connection to the land and, and our place in creation, I was taught by my language instructor that um, language is important in ceremony. And the reason for that is, is that when we're doing ceremony, if the only language that you know is English, then you're going to use English. But if you know your First Nation language or your Métis language or your Inuit language um, and you use that in ceremony, then you are in the natural state of being. And when you're speaking in the language that you're from, your your mother language and you're in ceremony it has more meaning and connection for you but also it resonates when you're in ceremony and using the language with the beings that are there with the spirits that are there with the land that is there the plants the animals and um when we're talking about um in ceremony and i and when i do my four direction prayers when I say Wabanong, Wabanong is the word we use for East, but when I say Wabanong, the image that comes to my mind is that sunrise in the morning, that creation of the new day, the blessing of being here again. When I turn and do my prayers to the south, I say Jawanong. Jawanong, I see the sun up above me in the sky as it's traveling. And I know that Jawanong is the south, and the reason the sun looks like it's move to the south is because I'm on the northern hemisphere and the sun is following a path that is south of me and it's traveling. Uh, when I say Epish Gemung, I can see the blue and the black as the sun is going down and the stars are starting to come out and that is important to me as well. And when I turn and say my prayers to the north and I talk about, uh, and I talk about where the elder sit, where the wisdom sits, it's those, it's those stars that um, the ancestors that were here prior to um, me being where I am and being in my place today. And I think of those ancestors and those tracks that they made for me to be here to do this ceremony. And so when I talk about Jesus and I'm looking at the sun, I know that life wouldn't be present unless the Father Son was up there. And when I talk about... Uh, Tebik Jesus, Grandmother Moon, I know she controls uh, the reproductive cycles, the tides, um, the ebb and flow of what happens on the earth. And so when I'm in ceremony and I'm saying those things and I'm using the language, it isn't just a, about the language itself, but it's those images and that connection to the land that we use when we're, when we're doing our ceremony that is as important as the ceremony itself because it brings it all together and connects it. And so that is why I uh, strongly encourage everybody to try to learn as much as their language um, as possible. And if you only know English, then use English. But if you can learn one or two of the words in the language and you can incorporate them into your ceremonies, then do that. And as you use it, the more you use it, the more it'll expand and the more language you'll be able to take. I didn't start learning my language until I was 16. Um, I am 54 now, and I now share what I've learned with others. And I never want somebody else to experience what I went through trying to find what my language was and, and where I could acquire it and uh, how far I'd have to travel to go and learn it. and all the hurdles that I had to go to. The reason I teach it is so that nobody has to go through that hardship that I went through. I want to make it accessible for them. 